Hi, and welcome to Real Trail Talk. I'm Donovan D'Souza from The Long Way Is Better. And I'm Mark Pybus from The Life of Pi. Welcome to episode 25. We've hit the quarter century. I yeah. Didn't think we'd get there, <laughs> but we did. And for this podcast, we have been joined by Alyssa again. Hello, Alyssa. Hello, I'm back. She's back. She is back because we are talking about the Walls of Jerusalem hike in Tasmania. So it's a multi-day hike. Mm. You can do it over one day or eight days. It's a, it's a bit of a choose-your-own-adventure kind of hike. So unlike you know, the Overland Track or the Three Capes where there's a clear sort of story... The Walls of Jerusalem is an area that's, I guess, a bit more open to exploration and there's no set, this is the way you should do it. But there is some classic walks. So there is the Walls of Jerusalem circuit, which is sort of the, the most normal, I guess, way of people doing it. People, I think, either do it as a there and back walk uh, overnighting within the walls or doing a circuit. So we're going to be following the Long Ways Better version of this hike so you guys did it over two nights and three days yep that's right so you guys did this in april this year so you're perfect autumn time but autumn time in tasmania is not really autumn is it we magically had the perfect timing i believe a couple of days just before we were set to go it was snowing really heavily Mm. and had magically cleared the day before we set out and all through our time the three days we had just the best, most clear, perfect mm. weather. I think when you say it's not really autumn, do you mean in terms of like how cold it is? Uh, just in terms of WA. So you're getting snow in WA is like <laughs> the peak coldness of winter <laughs> and you only get a dusting. Yeah. I think you could say that it is a classic fall because of the leaves. You know, like it's really... If you're talking about autumn leaves, there's not a lot of places in Australia that have deciduous trees. And Tassie's one of those places. So it's, it's, I think it's a classically autumnal place, but uh, not autumn as we know in Western Australia. Yeah, not like getting ready for the hiking season. This is kind of winding down the yeah. hiking season in yeah. Tassie. Yeah. All right, so in terms of location, we've already done the Overland Track podcast. Where in relation to the Overland and the capital cities of Tasmania is the Walls of Jerusalem? Okay, so the Walls of Jerusalem is part of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, which covers pretty much all of the state, almost. Well, sorry, no. So it's the World Heritage Area, which covers, you know, I think about a third of the state. And it's, it's in an area that is a bit to the northeast of the World Heritage Area. So I think a lot of the time we think of the wild part of the state as the, the southwest. But this is near Launceston. It's nearer to Launceston than the Overland is. And you can actually see the mountains of the Overland from the walls. So the walls is part of, it's sort of heading more towards the central plateau area. And it is reachable from the same road that takes you to the Overland, just you know, taking a detour from there to the walls area. Mm. And previously, you guys booked through a tour company and got a, a lift from Launceston. How was your experience getting to the start of the Walls of Jerusalem this time? It was nice and cruisy. It was a lovely ride. Um, the gentleman was yeah, really friendly and pretty direct and got a coffee and he kind of gave us lots of advice and tips and information about the area and yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I guess compared to the Overland, we did have to pay. It was a private charter sort oh, of vehicle. So, yep. Hence the personalized experience. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think the difference is here is that when we did the Overland, we had a, there's a bus there. It's very frequent. It's completely user friendly. You know, they even arranged to move your trans, transport your luggage from one end to the other side. This was not so. You know, I think it's it's free, unlike the Overland. You don't have to pay to do it, but it's much more difficult to get to. And we could have hired a car, but I had this paranoia of our car getting stolen from the Walls of Jerusalem car park. So we paid quite a bit of money to get the charter vehicle to bring us there. And, you know, in hindsight, probably we could have hired a car and it would have been a lot cheaper, but 
the peace of mind was that we didn't have to worry that we would return to the car park and find the car stolen and have no way to get back to Launceston. So that yeah. was the reason. And the guy was really lovely. He was a great service. He was on time. He got there perfectly, just as we had finished our hike. So you couldn't have asked for anything more. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. So you guys are at the start. What's mm. planned for day one? So the way that we sort of broke up the circuit was that we decided that Dixon's Kingdom would be our base and we would stay there two nights. Some people do this differently. Some people stay at Wild Dog Creek. Some people, you know, do any of the different... You could do it in the reverse order, I guess. But we decided that we were going to go through to the central walls, past Wild Dog Creek, which is the preferred campsite by Tasmanian Parks and Wildlife, but it's not the best campsite. Uh, and we went to Dixon's Kingdom instead, which is, I think, one of the really magical campsites. Probably one of the best we've we've stayed at, I think. Would you agree? Yeah, it was beautiful. But that did mean the first day being quite a long day and also kind of that arduous first hill was kind of mm. the big kind of... There's no way you could not know that you're starting a hike in Tasmania than what kind of... What's the... Elevation? You it told was me a 550 meter increase in elevation of yep. a 2.5 k's. So it hits pretty hard, pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's yeah. like the equivalent of hiking up Bluff Knoll, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Except you've got a full pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First day straight up. Yeah. Yep. And that's not your preferred hiking, is it, Alyssa? No, it yeah. wasn't. But I kind of don't mind knowing that it's the first thing we're we're doing, and that mm. and Don had assured me that kind of after the he's like the first couple hours it's going to be really hard but then it's going to flatten it out yeah and which you were you were pretty much right it's yeah. it's one of those things where you know some hikes you have you know peaks and troughs whereas this is very much once you get that over over and done with mm. the rest is not that hard and as we'll talk about later the peaks are really easy in comparison to some of the other hikes mm. we've done and I guess this comes into like the walls bit of the walls of Jerusalem because that's mm. what you're trying to overcome, isn't it? Yeah, because the so you basically get up to the central plateau, and then there's these walls of rock, which are the walls of Jerusalem, and they are these sort of low mountains that. So when I say low, you know, as a Western Australian, they're not low. You know, I think by, by you know, Tassie standards, it'd be like, nothing. Yeah. But for us, they were, you know, quite impressive. So you've hiked your 2Ks and your 550 metre elevation and you reach Trapper's Hut. What's that like when you arrive and kind of to get a good breather after all that climbing? Yeah, so Trapper's is a bit rinky-dink, I think. It's a bit, it's had, it's seen better days and yeah. I think it probably never had great days. <laughs> It looks, I mean, compared to the Overland track, this is not luxury. No, all the all the huts I think I saw on the walls of Jerusalem look like horror movie huts where you'd stay, but there's potentially some kind of voodoo omen underneath the wooden floorboards. Yeah. That's the vibe I get. <laughs> I think that that's a fair assessment, and I think that's probably the vibe that Parks and Wildlife are going for because they don't really like people staying well, in the huts. Convenient. So, <laughs> yeah, they have the axe murderer look. The So Trapper's Hut is so called because they used to trap for furs. So they used to get possums and wallabies and they used to hang the, the skins in there. So it probably does have a bit of a horror movie kind of yeah. quality. So do you think there's like a... Tazzy Parks and Wildlife guy like dressing up every now and then to create like a little <laughs> little myth or legend to keep it going. <laughs> Who knows? They 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 certainly have I think a bit more money than they have in Western Australia, so I wouldn't be surprised if they could afford to have yeah. such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on from Trapper's Hut, uh, kind of does it get a little bit flatter from here on out? So the the five hundred and fifty meter increase has. Another 0.5 kilometers of walking from the the hut till the end of the ascent, and then from there, it's pretty sweet. You know, it's quite easy going, and that's when you start to see some of the glacial lakes. So you see all these lakes that have been carved over time by glaciers having you know just driven into the rock, mm. and also you start to see because I think along you know along the ascent it's a lot more eucalypts that kind of. You know, they don't look too dissimilar to what you might find in, in Western Australia. 
But then suddenly you're in a completely different world. And that's where all the snow started to creep in and the mm. little kind of puddles that are iced over and I started to really slow down at that point. <laughs> yeah. Getting distracted by ice and snow and yeah. watching and looking at how it's all formed and it yeah, was so was quite fascinating. It was so cool to be looking across because we, you know, once we were up into the plateau and then you look to the west and you see all of the mountains of the Overland Track and especially you see Barnes Bluff. I think, you know, Cradle Mountain may be the most famous of the mountains of the Overland, but Barnes Bluff is the most distinctive from afar and to see all of them covered in snow was just a really lovely... Mm sight and and because you go oh i know where that is i've I've been been there there. i can see my house from here (laughs) (laughs) i think we could see oakley and Ossa at some points as well yeah uh so that was really cool and seeing them covered in snow which was so different to when we were there in summer Mm. and you know at this stage we didn't know whether there would be much snow within the central walls so whatever we, whenever we found a little tiny patch of snow, we got really excited. Yeah, and we knew, like I'd said, it we knew it had snowed, but we weren't sure how fast it had melted or, yeah, what to expect. Yeah. So yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Right. And I think at that point you had gained some ground, and I had <laughs> lagged quite a bit far behind you, getting yeah. distracted. Because you were you were smashing ice. Yes. Also, I think. I was probably, I mean, the uh, I'm not great at ascents, mm. and I know I take my time, so I knew we'd already kind of had a bit of a gap between us from just pushing upwards, mm. mm-hmm. and there were some um, lovely, some lovely people who were very friendly and gave us chocolate cake at Trapper's Hut, but then I uh, got a little funny with you because they thought that you were being a little. Um, Ungentlemanly, yeah. <laughs> Don Don like, because <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa and I have an agreement with this sort of thing that if you know, I I, I kind of just keep going and Alyssa will catch up and I eventually, when I think that I'm a bit far away, I stop, I wait, and then we're good. And that's just so that we can both walk at our own paces and yeah. we're not, you know, we're not impacting on each other's yeah, and enjoyment. obviously still being safe. Like, I've got first aid and I know what to do. And there was enough people around that me lagging behind wasn't going to be a big problem. Mm. But uh, this gentleman was very, I guess, a little annoyed at you that he thought I was struggling really badly. Yeah. I think he thought that you were completely inexperienced. And he was also extremely hyperbolic in saying that you were half an hour behind. Yeah. So this guy came and told Don that I was half an hour behind and he'd better turn around and grab my pack because I was struggling so much, which I was struggling just out of being unfit, but <laughs> I was still pushing through and I was still enjoying it and going mm. at my own pace. Mm. But um, I was definitely not half an hour behind. Mm. So that was, you were a little put out for, for well, a Well, I was worried the- because I thought that you were really like, I knew that you were behind, but not half an hour behind. I thought, yeah. oh, crap, you know, what have, you know, so I actually put my bag down and went back to see where you were, and then you were only like 10 minutes away. Yeah, and I was totally fine strolling just along. smashing the smashing ice. Smashing ice and <laughs> pointing out at different mountains. It was great. Mm. Mm. Dare I say, hiking your own hike. Exactly. Hey. Hey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we, I mean. He the, was meaning well. He was just looking yeah. out for me and was trying to do the chivalrous thing. The thing, you know, I think for us, Especially because, I mean, I was hiking in Queensland, but you come from Western Australia where it's not hiking season. This is a pretty intense first hike for the season. I had not yeah. hiked for months <laughs> since Vietnam. No, since Queensland. Since but Queensland, that, that was yeah. like short day hike. So my hiking fitness was definitely not there. And like I said, the first first part of the hike was probably the hardest part. So yeah. And with a full pack of probably like 18 kilos. Yeah. Of food and water and clothes. Imagine yeah. doing Bluff Knoll with a full pack as your first hike for the season. That's Woo-hoo. what we did. So, <laughs> yep. yeah. So you've hit like the plateau area and it's nice and fun now for you, Alyssa. There's yep. lots of lakes and forests and everything around. What's the walking like to Wild Dog Creek? It was quite nice meandering through kind of rocky paths that weren't too, not kind of like nice kind of undulating path. It wasn't too kind of up, 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 down, down, down. Kind of very even, and I think I can't. To be honest, I can't quite remember the 
scenery was so stunning I don't think I was it's a struggle between trying to watch where you're walking so you don't fall and hurt yourself or roll an ankle but also just constantly being amazed by Mm. what you're seeing just the alpine scenery change Mm. is really quite distinct so they had the snow gums and Mm. my one of my favorite trees in the world the pencil pine you know we started to see the first few pencil pines yep you just feel like, ah, oh, I'm in Tasmania. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you mentioned that this was the area that had a lot of pencil pines compared to, say, the overland. Mm. I mean, compared to, I think, anywhere. This, so there it used to be even more. So there used to be called the Great Pine Plateau, which we could see later on in the walk, and it was all burnt in a fire. However, there are still, I think, compared to anywhere else in Tassie, just the amount of pencil pines that you see up there is incredible and you know, it's such a beautiful tree because it's, it's, you know, I, I find Pinus radiata has an almost disgusting symmetry about it. And these trees, you know, because they're, you know, they're blown by the wind and they've got the snow to deal with. They grow in all these gnarly kind of shapes mm. and they have so much character and they live for so long, but are so, f- um, you know, just prone to, to being destroyed by fire. Mm. So there's a certain fragile beauty about them. Yeah, you'd imagine like the native pines that were on Rotnest would have been like that, especially given mm. how wind blowing the trees that still are there. Um, yeah, ended up like yeah, that would have been interesting to see as well. Yeah, I think that that would have had a similar character because I think a lot of the Australian pines have that. You know that they're not great to build a house out of because they're not straight, <laughs> but there's just something really beautiful about a tree that is not perfect. Mm. Yeah, it's probably saved them in the end. <laughs> been, been a little bit wonky. Yeah. Yeah, so you're kind of running up to Wild Dog Creek, and you mentioned before that this was not your preferred campsite, mm. but it is Parks and Wildlife's preferred campsite. You just want to run through your reasons why that is? So historically, people used to be able to camp anywhere, but due to the fact that this is clean alpine areas, they used to, you know, burying human waste... It's not great in this sort of climate because the water's flowing into the walls. So they really discourage anyone. It's it's now banned to camp within the central walls. And so they prefer that people camp in this area here because there's no pencil pines or not as many pencil pines. So it's with there's less problems of people, you know, lighting a campfire or something and it, it all burning up, which you're not allowed to do. You know, this is... World Heritage Area, fuel stove only, do not light a fire. But, you know, some people are idiots and do it anyway. So this is why they prefer it. And they have made this a fairly deluxe campsite as a result to make people want to stay there. So they've got all the tent platforms that you might find on the overlands. The only thing really missing is that there's no hut here. I think if there was a hut there, people might be more inclined to stay. They had a running water tap. They had the toilets. Yeah, it's quite nice. It's a in terms of facilities. If you if amenities is your main thing, mm. it is probably one of the the better campgrounds you'll find on a track. But compared to Dixon's Kingdom, it's lacking in character, and it's not ideally located. I think why we, we were saying because a lot of the side trips we wanted to do were up in the pl- in the saddle. So to stay in Wild Dog, we had to go up the saddle, do all the side trips, then back down. And then to exit, we were going to have to go back up the saddle again. So it felt like we were kind of doing a lot of go back, come back, go back. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It sort of adds a lot of extra kilometers to your day for no reason. So it was more efficient to stay yeah. in Dixon's. Whereas, yeah, Dixon's ha- has... It's location, location, location. Everything is <laughs> is from there. Yeah. But as you said, it's a choose your own adventure, so you have that option. Mm. Um, it's just, yeah, not the, the nicest in terms of facilities on the, the track or if, the walk. If you were doing just an overnighter, I could imagine just going to Wild Dogs, camping there, going off doing the side trip, coming back and out that way. That would be... Yeah. That That's would be, an efficient use of wild dog. That would be a pretty good use of the of the area, I think. Yeah, mm. I think you're quite right there. Mm. Okay, so you guys had lunch here, and then you set off, as you said, up the saddle. Yep. So there's some very biblical names. Do you, do you guys know why it's named as it is? I think I read somewhere about someone having a liking to really Greek mythology, because 
I think it's lots of biblical names, but then there's also lots of. So the Greek names Greek are names. more on the, the overland, overland side. side. Mm. But I think that they. So the, the fanciful nature of the names, I think, came from that. And then because of there is the wall, which is a natural wall, they decided. Because originally it was called the China Wall, and then they decided to Mm-mm. call it yeah. the Walls of Jerusalem, which I think. You know, when you hear the walls of Jerusalem, it has a certain sort of romantic mystique about it. Yeah. And that's what I like about Tassie is all these names, like even if I didn't match them up to the photo, stuff like Damascus Gate or Temple and Solomon's Throne, like they're fanciful names. And I want to go <laughs> visit those old, places. It's worldly. worldly. It's yeah, kind like, of... mm. like you're wandering into a different world and like mm. there may be a giant or a cyclops like yeah. guarding this gate. Or... <laughs> the wall of Jerusalem reminded me a little of the gate, like the big wall in um, Game of Thrones, oh, yeah. like mm. the wall of the north yeah. has that feel. Mm. Mm. And that's that. So walking to Damascus Gate is when you walk through the central walls and it is breathtaking. It is just absolutely stunning. So you, so once you leave Wild Dog Creek, you ascend a little bit, and then you're in the central walls, and it just looks like something out of, you know, out of like when you see photos of of Canada, of you know, of real beautiful glacial landscapes. Mm. It just was, you know, you, we would just stop and just look everywhere, and there was you know all the snow. The track was just covered in snow. And you had all these beautiful glacial lakes, all the pine trees, and just this solid wall of rock. On, Don would on say side. that his his soul was whole again; that it had healed. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Don gets very um, r- romanticizes <laughs> the, mountains. The, the, mountains the mountains and the feeling it gives him. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's just cleanest alpine water, clean alpine air. You know, just had everything it was just perfect and this was such a change for me because you'd finished your time up in queensland in your hot humid oh. conditions and then here <laughs> you are in this crisp like mountain alpine air yeah and the weather was just absolutely perfect because it was it was warmish to it wasn't hot it just had you know the nice cool kind of autumn or, or spring kind of temperatures you know obviously being that high up it was pretty cold but because the sun was out, it really helped warm us up, and it was just very comfortable. So back to the like choose your own adventure thing. There's lots of side trips on here, and your first one of the day was the, the Pool of Bethesda. Mm. Um, so it's a little alpine tarn full mm. of pencil pines again, and really lovely. Yeah. So this this used to be a really popular campsite. Uh, Alyssa, I think, was... I don't remember. Don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> totally no no di- food. <laughs> I don't... Yeah, there was nothing... I didn't eat anything that I could remember it by, so... <laughs> yeah. Um, so this was a really popular spot, and it is beautiful. You know, it, it's a small but pretty little lake. And, you know, it's it's now... I'm glad that they've left it be so that people don't ruin it. And then from there, it's just a short walk to Damascus Gate, which is the sort of saddle where two different side trips start and i think by that point i had maybe had enough enough. (laughs) (laughs) i think i was like i'm not doing the side trips yeah for that day and i built a snowman Mm. because i was i think i was still captivated by the snow at that point i'd never walked in snow yeah i mean we we'd walked in in patches of snow on the overland We'd walked through Kosciuszko on that same trip where there were patches of but snow. But not to the degree that the snow was. Exactly. Yeah. Like not where you've got snow that is, you know, at, at times knee deep and covering large areas of, of the track and the, the surrounding landscape, whereas we've never seen that yeah, before. It's quite a novelty, I mm. think, for us. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to build a snowman. And and I think that that's... That makes this really a great time of year to be in Tassie because it's the weather's sort of calm enough. It's not you know dangerously snowy like winter can possibly be, but you get that nice bit of snow to give it a bit of character. So I mm. think it, I think that the area looked better. I've seen photos of the walls without the snow. I think it looks better with the snow. Mm. Mm. So you were building snowmans, Alyssa. Yes, snowmen. Or women. I no, know I wasn't there. I didn't, I didn't really ask its gender. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but Don, you decided to go on another side trip up mm. to the temple. Mm. Um, was it like is it a good little side trip worth doing? Yeah, I mean, I think the temple is one of the the lesser side trips. It's probably the least of the three main peaks. So Solomon's throne, we were told, was snowed out. They said probably not not safe to do because the shoot you could just see there was a snow, and as a result, that was my my initial plan was to do to do Solomon's throne because it looks amazing mm. and it was the one I wanted to do. But the temple was safe. It was not snowed under. So I was able to, to climb up that and then make my way across to the to the summit itself. And it's a really good spot. Great grandstand views. It's sort of in the middle of the central wall so you can see uh, t you know the Sol Solomon's throne and King David's peak which are connected by the the main wall. You can see the 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 tons in inside them in the middle. You can have a view to the southwest, so you can see Dixon's Kingdom and you can see Lake Ball, and sort of the area where you'd have to leave on the last day to get back to complete the circuit. And you can see Mount Jerusalem, which was going to be our side trip for the next day. So it's really a great spot in that sense. And also the other cool thing was because part of it was in the shade, there was quite a lot of snow on one side, and there's a photo up on the blog where it looks amazing because it's just this wall of snow and the the illusion is that we were in like this amazing winter wonderland when you know not not all of it was as snowy as that but this bit looked absolutely snowed under so you've summited that on your own and got the amazing views and you went back down to see Alyssa's progress on her snowmen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or snow people <laughs> I should say just one yeah, and then you guys went on from there, and that's when you got the kind of the snowy pencil pine area that was in the shade. It's like heading down into Dixon's. Mm. Mm. It was pretty sim pretty nice and easy from there, oh, except for the slippery. Um, they had like wood platforms, and because they'd been iced over, there was quite a few like slip yep. slip slidey mm. moments where I, I don't think I fell on my butt. No, I don't think you I did. I think it was close. Mm. I think having the walking sticks for that reason were really good. This is good because you don't have a great track record, neither of you do. <laughs> no. Nope. Slipping and getting injured. We have a tendency to slip and fall. Yeah. So it's a good good final stretch down into Dixon's Kingdom to finish the day. Mm. Nice and easy. Yeah, I think we got there with a good time to set up and get changed, get some fresh water, mm. make some food. And it got as soon as it got dark, it was pretty much pitch black and the temperature dropped mm. hugely so you didn't really like you kind of had like limited time to get everything organized and sorted and then as soon as it was dark it was bed mm. yeah <laughs> however we had some really cool animal sightings oh it was amazing as soon as that darkness hit it's like we were swamped with possums just possum like huge possums the sizes of Volkswagens. Dogs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Close. But, um, and, and, and really abs aggressive, like yeah. getting into stuff, like going under fly tents and oh, wow. going through things. And we were really worried about our brand new tent um, that we just, that was the first time trying it. We were worried that having our food in our tent, mm. that we're going to scratch through, like stories from the overland. Mm. So we um, con quickly constructed something in the hut so that hopefully they wouldn't. And they didn't Dangling. take it. No. However, the bag hasn't been the same. So I had this waterproof bag that I bought for Karajini. And it had been my bag to carry things in because it was, you know, tough and waterproof. Mm. And we found that the bag has a little hole at the bottom. <laughs> so obviously a little clawing Someone hand attempted. was trying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah. no one got it. So we won in the end. Yeah. So you guys yeah. mentioned there's a hut there, but it's not really for sleeping in, though, is no. it? No. I mean, you can, but you're not really supposed to. I think to. unless it's like emergency, yeah. snowed under. And also kind of we scenario. saw some rat poo inside, so... We saw some... Uh, I think I saw a rat. Um, and there was a quoll that lived there. Well, that was the like really an cool aggressive thing. aggressive quoll. Was we, you know, we had never seen a quoll before. And we were... Watching these, you know, these possums fight. And then we saw this smaller thing run across. And we didn't didn't register until we shone, when we shone the torch at it. 
and then we saw the classic spots and went, Quo! <laughs> it's a <like>, Quo! <laughs> yeah. So that's another, that was a great little thing to tick off our uh, our list of, of animal sightings. Animal bingo. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah. So what are the facilities like at Dixon Kingdom? Um, they've got two toilets, mm. high rise toilets, like the ones on Overland. Uh, they're a bit less good, but they're. Was... Yeah, they were, so they play they play it down. They say, "Oh, there's temporary toilets there." So, what they want to do is build some nicer toilets. However, the temporary facilities there are still awesome. You would be pretty happy with the toilets there. You know, like it. It's um, better than what you would expect on probably the Cape to Cape. Maybe not as good as some of the of the. Um, Bibbleman track ones, not as good as the as the Overland, which is really deluxe. But you know, you'd be pretty happy with that as a toilet. They're acceptable. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You know, no so, complaints. Certainly, it's better than some of the terrible pit toilets that you'll get. So mm. I, I wouldn't be upset about that. And the water, though, was the really cool thing. I was about <laughs> to ask you about that. How, what <laughs> makes this water so cool? It is from the nearby mountain so it's just flowing down a stream and there's a stream right near Dixon's Kingdom so you can kind of tell people built a hut here because there was a reliable water source clean glacial water Mm. Mm. and so we were able we were getting water that probably only had one or two hundred meters of descent from the absolute top Mm. so this was really clean water and yes we treated it with um, a SteriPen but I think you could probably drink it and you'd be fine. So you guys were living in a, a water, a bottled water commercial. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Waking up next to your alpine stream and mm-hmm. yeah. dipping your bottles and in. And it was so cold. It was so cold that the, the SteriPen didn't work sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to boil water to pour into our water bottles to even out the temperature oh, wow. so that the SteriPen would work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was delicious water. Yeah. Really delicious water. Yeah, so you guys stayed at Dixon's Kingdom, and now it's also you're going to be your stay for the next night. So you guys left. Did you guys leave your packs there in your tent? Yeah, yeah. And you went off exploring today. So you've got Mount Jerusalem first mm. up on the menu. But how far is it from Dixon's Kingdom to get to Mount Jerusalem? It's not far. It's about a four-kilometer, one and a half-hour return trip to do the side trip to Mount Jerusalem, and the the track starts right where Dixon's Kingdom is. This is why I say that this is a, the best spot to camp because all the side trips are within easy reach. And it really is, I think, one of the best mountain walks we've done. I think you loved it and you're always a bit eh, about mountain walks. Well, it didn't feel too, like, intensely up. Like, it was quite a nice... It, I, I felt... For some reason, I don't know whether I don't know what the elevation chart looks like, but it felt like it was quite evenly paced in terms of how we moved up. Like obviously, it was challenging because it's a mountain, but I didn't feel like I was struggling at any point, or mm. I felt like there was enough amazing things to look at that I wasn't thinking about the struggle. Mm. So, like, it was quite. I think there's beautiful little um, tans, tans, and kind of still icy little sheens on the tarns Mm. yeah so i was quite entertained going up i think it was one of those walks where there was quite a gradual ascent and the reward for the effort was through the roof yeah so i didn't have to put much effort in to still see amazing things and Mm. it's probably because we were already quite high yeah exactly so to hit up Jerusalem, we're already part of the way mm. by just starting from Dixon's. You'd done all the the literal heavy lifting of your gear yeah. the day before, <laughs> so now with your your little now packs, the pay you off. can yeah just enjoy yourself. Yeah, mm, exactly. I remember there was that little section towards the top where it was really packed with snow, and you're kind of stepping down, not knowing whether you're on the path, whether you're about to stand on a rock, and it was just kind of knee deep more than knee deep snow kind mm. of just you could see where other people had been before us and you're just kind of following their like little holes stepping through the holes to try and get up that was kind yeah. of exciting i think the view from the summit was truly just mm. breathtaking that was a nice morning mm. 
Yeah, there's a great, great shot on the blog of uh, Alyssa just nonchalantly just walking through this snow as if it's just nothing. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ain't nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so that was your first adventure of the day, and then you went back and did Solomon's Throne. Mm. Well, some of you did Solomon's Throne. Yeah, I decided that I'd, I I was a little scared about Solomon's Throne. I um I was already nervous about it seeing pictures and reading up about it before we went. Mm. And then while Don was off doing a side trip and I was building snowmen, I was talking to people around in the area and they were talking about how quite hard it was at the time being so snowed through, mm. not knowing your footing as you're walking up through the snow, the snow giving away. And also with the snow being so heavy, you could take a step and slide back down off the cliff face. Yeah. And all my overactive imagination was going wild and I'm not great with heights. Mm. So I decided, no, I'll build another snowman and read Harry Potter. Mm. Um, And (laughs) there was these lovely um, Dutch guys who we knew were also going to do it that day. And we asked if they minded if we all went together. Mm. And nice. we we had known that it was doable because the previous day a German guy did it. He was the only person the whole day. He said that mm. when he got there, there's a lot of footprints going and then turning around. <laughs> and he was the only person who went up. Uh, I met multiple people that had tried and then said they felt so scared that they just turned around. Yeah. So we knew it could be done. There were three of us and we were like, yeah, okay, we're going to do it. Yeah. It was pretty scary though. Because climbing up wasn't the problem. Because when you're going up, you know, if you're going to fall, you're probably going to fall forward. It was okay. We, we used the, the German guy's footprints to kind of guide us as to where it was safe to go. And then the views from the top were amazing. You know, you get another great view of the central walls. And if we had more time, you can scramble across to King David's Peak along the wall. But because Alyssa wasn't climbing, she had waited for us at Damascus Gate. I thought mm, it's not nice to to do the whole thing. So the journey down, though, was horrifying because <laughs> when you're looking down the chute, it's this, basically this chasm, kind of like a slot canyon between two walls, and the the slope just keeps going all the way down the mountain. So the way the mountains in Tassie look is generally there's... The, the top bit, which was below, which was above the um, the glacier. And then there's the bits on the side that have been scoured out and they've got a nice slope to it. So this particular chute is basically a slope that continues through the, top, the bit that would have been above the glacier and then down the slope. So you're talking about hundreds of meters of drop. Mm. And if you did fall, you would just keep sliding down until you maybe grab something or die. So coming down, we were walking you know, through this snow that was at times more than knee deep and at times was collapsing <laughs> and just was you know, pretty scary to go down. And, you know, sometimes there were bits of where the, the safest way through was to just push through. So like we were in a hole and then just push through the hole to get to the next hole because there was no way to go. Like if you climbed over it, you might overshoot and then fall. Mm. So yeah, probably wasn't the safest thing to do. I, I see Alyssa shaking her head. <laughs> I, I'm so glad I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, so I it feel sweaty things. palms from just hearing about it. Yeah. Where well, your imagination was probably right. In yep, this instant, I'm yeah. I'm quite, yeah. And I think if you're anxious about that stuff and you have hesitations, I think, I don't know. I feel like going in with confidence sometimes is the best strategy. And if you're going to be hesitant, you might be more inclined to make hesitant steps and therefore be more blundering. Mm. I think people sometimes think, oh, yeah, it's not too bad, I'll be able to do it or I'll just push through. But sometimes you just don't or mm. you can't and then that's when things start to go wrong, especially if you freeze or do something wrong or panic, then that's... Second when, guess. Yeah. So, yeah. And I was already feeling a bit sore from the day before having pushed it more than I had been used to. Mm. So I was like, I'm, I'm happy with what I've done. This yeah. is still amazing. You're reading Harry Potter. How yeah, could re- things go wrong? I know. <laughs> Making snowmen and reading Harry Potter. So yeah. it was great mm. for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you Dutch guys, were they typically Dutch height? 
because they are a very tall race in the world. One of them wasn't tall. The other one was a giant. Yeah. yeah. So would he be able to clear the path? <laughs> <laughs> he went first. He he was able to climb over the holes quite easily, whereas myself and the guy who was shorter, we struggled a bit more, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because he wasn't much taller than me. And that was your last kind of side trip for the day, wasn't it? And you're back at Dixon's Kingdom. Yeah, so it was a pretty chill day. You know, it's like doing two side trips and having a base camp, which I think if we had started at, if we had stayed at Wild Dog Creek, it would have been walking from Wild Dog Creek to probably the saddle, doing the side trip, and then going to Dixon's and then doing the other side trip to the to Mount Jerusalem. But because we were in the one location, it just didn't mean we meant we didn't have to set up again, which mm. is good. Yeah, and also didn't have to carry your packs for those kind of side trips up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So did, were the animal sightings any better on night two at Dixon's Kingdom? They were there, but... I think that was the night that they were a bit more active. Or was that the first night? I think the first night, because there were more people on the first oh, night. Oh, that's true. Whereas the second night, things had calmed down. But we met we met a Western Australian guy, which was interesting, because he... The, he organises a lot of hikes in the Kimberley. And it was really interesting talking to him because he does these walks that he does by himself. And I said to him, oh, you know, I really feel like there needs to be a trail. And you know, you know, Mark, like I yeah. always am like, oh, why isn't there a trail in the north? It can happen. And he was like, no, I don't want one, one there to be one. <laughs> <laughs> he was just yeah. completely against it, even though, you know, he comes to Tassie and does all these on-track walks. Mm. Like my, my country up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the second night was much quieter. I think a lot of people had gone in for that awesome day, mm. stayed over and then left, and we being staying for the second night. Yeah, a lot of people cleared out. There was only maybe two or three other groups mm. in the area, whereas the previous night there was like I don't know, six or seven even mm. quite active. Mm. I had terrible night sleeps, I remember. Yeah. Is that because of the way Don maybe set up the tent? Oh, it was, the first night it was on, so it was on a diagonal with our head at the top and our feet down the bottom, but I, I find the El Cedar Summit mat, I just slid down. Mm. So I was constantly trying to like scramble back up. Um, yeah. And we moved it slightly the second night and it was much better. But I'm just a terrible, I'm not someone who mm. naturally falls asleep easily. And you have camping. post, you have post German man trauma. <laughs> After Overland. what happened from the Overland track, I think. But even, like, the second night, hardly anyone was around, and I felt pretty tired. I Even then, I slept better, but not amazingly. Mm. Yeah, I'm just not a camp sleeper. I think I've come to that realisation. Mm. Mm. Yeah, unless you give me a proper bed, like in Karajini. Yeah. With a, a big, giant, inflatable one that you can carry by a car. Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. I slept great, but... No, hike. I think lightweight hiking gear and sleeping for me. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's I think worth it. it. I think it takes it, it takes time. Like I think if it was an eight day hike, you would you would just get so tired that you eventually do. But on a shorter one, like the first this, couple of nights, I never sleep even on like a seven eight day hike. Yeah. Hmm. But the next day was the night last day, so yeah. you have the glint of a shower and a and a food and. Yeah. And a nice bed in your eye, you kind of don't all that doesn't matter. You just get through the night and wake up so you can enjoy the scenery again. Mm, exactly. Yeah. No, but it wasn't exactly a short, short day in terms of Tassie though, was it? The final day. It was a fair hike out from yeah, where you were. It was. Quite a longer loop around. So yeah, I guess the last day is an interesting one because it's you know, when you look at the map of where the track is, you go, What? Where's the how is this a circuit? Because the developed track only goes to Dixon's and that's it. And it's only when you do a little bit more looking that you realize that what you're supposed to do if you want to do a circuit is to walk out through Jaffa Vale and you have to walk along what is not a defined track. There's bits that are tracked and bits that are untracked. Which I think actually was probably a is good... This, yeah, is this where it all began? <laughs> I, I think so, because, you know, as, as um, readers of The Long Ways Better will know, that this year has been a real off-track year for me. I've done a lot of off-track hiking. And, yeah, I guess maybe this was, this was the, the genesis. 
put it down to this one day in Tasmania that Don the switch just went off and he's like you know what trails are for losers <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I think if, if everywhere could have a trail it would be better yeah because I think one of the things that has happened is a trail has formed here and it shouldn't have had that happen because some there are times probably where that where it's gone is not the best for an environmental purposes you know in terms of erosion and things like that and i think it would be better if there was a trail because i would rather see something like that and limit the environmental impact to a single corridor rather than having you know a, a mess of different trails everywhere mm. and they actually recommend that you walk in a fanned out manner through mm. some of these kind of more marshy areas, don't they? To they kind do. Of, um, prevent kind of creating pads and things like that. But when when a pad's already created, there's nothing that can be oh, done. And naturally, know? I don't. Something up about human nature. You see it, and you just naturally yeah. want to follow it. Because that's the way to go. You think someone else has been there. Yeah. Or there. That. And after like walking through bush, bush without knowing where you're going, to have some kind of affirmation that you're in the right direction, it's mm. really. Something in you is like really, ah, oh, okay, on the track again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So unlike a lot of other parts of Tassie and the official trails, there's no like duck board on this section. Is there for you to no. kind of be more environmentally friendly? No, not at all. Mm-hmm. We but just had to use the map and know that the river was on the left. Stay, keep the river on the left. Walk around the, through the, there was like a little foresty section and a big giant open air kind of marshy section. The dead marshes. Yep, something like that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think I made a comment about that at I one think point. You probably did. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's one of those things. You just got to use the landscape to navigate. And I mean, the maps in the guidebooks are not amazingly detailed, but they were detailed enough that you could kind of. And really, I mean, you're heading in this direction. There's, you know, hills on one side and hills mm. on the other side. You just have to go down that way, and then when you reach the lake, turn right. So you yeah. didn't need your View Ranger app? No, I didn't. Well, actually, you know what? I downloaded View Ranger. This was going to be our first View Ranger walk, right? Oh, um, but, and for people who don't know, View Ranger is a GPS app that I completely love. Don is not sponsored by yeah, he it. Wants he sponsorship just loves from it. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, you need to download the maps before you go out because this is the middle of nowhere. And so we got there and I went, okay, I turned on my View Ranger app. Oh, nope. I'm not going to be using this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we got there. We had a few moments where yeah. we might have gone a bit f- further up or further down because we knew that once we hit the side of the lake, we'd get onto some more formed track and there'd be markers. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, it took us a bit and we got there. That mm. was nice. Mm. And then from there on, it was just like a Lord of the Rings for that section of the lake. Mm. That was beautiful. There was amazing kind of old mossy trees and the trees were at that perfect time for the fagus the turning of the fagus <laughs> <laughs> which is you know if you're from somewhere like wa that doesn't have a true autumn except that when you when you see burnt trees and go oh yay golden leaves mm. that's kind of autumn right um you know here were trees that literally were autumn leaves and it was just absolutely stunning. I think it it's a nicer time of year to be in Tassie, to be honest, than summer. I think that we thought that if you're going to be in Tasmania, that autumn was probably one of the best times to be there because you get this, spect- this spectacular sight of autumn leaves and seeing these reds and yellows and oranges with the greens of the other trees and with these beautiful glacial lakes... It was just a lovely other side that we didn't see when we were in the central walls. Yeah, so you've got some lovely autumnal walking. Mm, yes. Uh, and then you come across Lake Ball Hut, um, another, another one of these kind of yeah, <laughs> murder huts. Yep, I would not want to stay in that hut. It for... does look, yeah, it's just it's, very it... drafty and dark and damp. And I, I think this one was quite historic. I remember there was like a little information panel mm. about it kind of being one of the earliest I mean I think they're all the historical I think this one wasn't one of the earliest but it was built by a guy who came back with sort of PTSD from the war 
I think it was from Vietnam War or Korean War, something like that. World War Two. Ah. Sorry. So, so this is a guy. Who came, he, you know, he came back from World War Two, and he was suffering, you know, from PTSD. So, you know, he built this to have the the seclusion and time by himself in the mountains to heal mentally. So, you know, it's a bit of a sad story, but you know, he spent his time out here in the wilderness, fly fishing, which. It's, I can see the appeal of that, and you know, people still do fly fishing in the walls. It's a very popular area, so yeah, I think it. I can see how this would have been a healing place for someone who maybe suffered from PTSD. Hmm. Mm, yeah, it certainly looks like a very tranquil, 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 mm, tranquil. very relaxing place. <laughs> 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 Call it that. Um, so after that hut, you kind of climb a little bit and walk along the ridge line. Mm. What were the views like? I'm guessing amazing, but what were the views like looking back towards Lake Ball? Yeah, stunning. It's just this beautiful, serene, kind of still, picturesque lake with the little hut and the trees turning. So I think we took I th- took some photos. It's just unbelievable. We it's took like a, a long painting. time to get through the section. Yeah, we, were just like, we spent oh, forever. Look at this! Look at this! And it was just really cool seeing the delineation on the side of the of the lake that we were on. There were all these, you know, autumn leaves, and all the trees were the the fagus. And on, on the other side, it was more eucalypts. So it was just a complete just change in vegetation mm. from one side to the other. And you. Obviously, walking up on that first day, you kind of have to walk down on that second day. Mm. Um, was that more enjoyable or was it um, kind of sad to know you're leaving? I think by the leaving? time we hit that point where we were going back down, the stretch was quite long and arduous. And I think by that point, I'd gotten pretty sick of walking, <laughs> dare I say. Am I yeah. allowed to say that? Um, and by the time we were going down, I think... My legs were quite sore, mm. and sometimes going down is just as hard as going up in different ways. Yeah. So I th- I thought it was going to be much more satisfying, but it was still really long. <laughs> I remember it, being surprised and being like, "Oh, I thought this would take far- wouldn't take as long." And also, I think the tracks through the central walls are very well constructed. They're sort of almost at an overland track standard. So there's duck boards, and you know, it's quite. Not maybe not dry boot, but almost dry boot. Whereas this is not at all. This is very much a wet boot hike. So there's, you know, there was a bit where the track just disappeared, where it went into the lake, and we went, oh, okay. I think we must have taken a wrong turn. So we we climbed up, and then we we looked down and went, oh no nope, no, nope, it is back down there. It we were meant to walk th- straight through the lake, and when we descended down through the forest, you know. We, we entered all these areas where there were, you know, creek crossings, river crossings and things like that, where you you reach the the, the river and there's a marker on one side and a marker on the other side. And it's just like, yep, you're going to have to walk straight through. You know, in WA, they would have built bridges over all of those, whereas mm-hmm. this is just like, no, this is hiking. This is what you have to do. Yeah. I suppose it makes it easier being the last day as well that you we don't have to put up with wet feet and wet shoes for another day. It's just until you get to the end. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You can put up with more. Yeah. So then after you kind of hit that, that marshy river crossing area, it turns into a bit of dry eucalyptus. Mm. Reminded you of home a little bit, didn't it? Yeah, for sure. It had, had a look of the Perth Hills about it, you know, mm. the, with the, the... I mean, it, the rock is dolerite instead of granite, but we have, we have dolerite in the Perth Hills. People, you know, always think... You know, I heard someone say that it was one of those, like... Urban List, one of those sort of places where they don't have, you know, any journalistic integrity. <laughs> and they <laughs> they commented that Bluff Knoll was made from granite, which is, you know, it's just basically just a view that if it's rock in Western Australia, it's granite. Yeah. And no, it's not all granite. And here was some, you know, some dolerite that was on the side of the track. And, you know, there is dolerite in the Perth Hills, so it could very well have been a scene from, you know, uh, somewhere near Kalamunda or Bickley Brook or and I think at like that. that point we were going down. I remember when we hit the eucalyptus because um, Lake Ball was quite high still in the plateau. As soon as we kind of turned around and were going down that le- eucalypt, it was kind of pushing down the other side of the walls mm. to kind of a way lower platform. That's where we got through the marshy section, right? Yeah, and there was that sec- there was a little campsite there which 
would be an awesome spot right by the side of Lake Adelaide. And it has these beautiful tall pencil pines and it's a designated campground, but there's no toilet. And that to me, again, you know, when we're talking about form trails, while I do understand leave no trace principles and how to do it, I think it's less inviting to people to do their business in a hole. And also, I think that it also is less good for the environment because people don't do the right thing sometimes. So especially in this area that's filled with lakes, I think that, you know, a toilet would be a good idea, especially if you look at in Tassie, in difficult to reach areas, they have these terrible pods that are up at the top and you have to open the lid and they're disgusting. But they maintain the quality of the water in the area by focusing all of the waste into this one spot. Um, Lake Adelaide, is that the connecting point to the overland? That's true, yeah. So if you turn, so we turned right to finish. To turn around, to fin turn yep. the loop. If you turn left at that point, there's more of the walls area you can explore. There's some, some of the old huts there are actually of a much higher standard. But if you keep going and follow, I think, Junction Lake Hut and there's another hut, you can join on to the overland track where the waterfalls are. So oh, you cross the Mercy uh, Mercy Valley and end up on the other side. So that, that's another cool thing that people sometimes do is they, they do a different version of getting into the overland. So there's, there's certainly a lot of different things that you can, you know, do in this area. Some people do that, get onto the overland track and then double back to New Pelion because New Pelion is one of the huts where you don't need to have a overland track pass to stay at. And that would be a cool loop that you could do mm. going, doing Mount Oakley and then finishing back in the, um, at the walls on the other side. So there's a lot of options. Mm. And you said that you guys are descending a little bit and you, in the blog mentioned that you come across an area that reminded you of the Pindurup Plains. Yeah. Uh, very waterlogged, <laughs> so that's probably the... Very flat. Yeah. I think nicer than, than, than those. You know, I, I, have <laughs> I have quite negative views yes. about this particular area in, on the, on the Bibbulmun, but it was, it was a nice different experience because they had a lot of um, cushion plants there and a lot of uh, little, you know, more tans and different vegetation, which was really cool. And, and I think being less rocky, you and I could pick up pace. That's true. It was true. kind of nice. It, after, I think you find walking on some of these tracks where there's just constant stones and and rocks in the way and you're kind of hobbling over things, to have like just a clear, flat, muddy track where you can just slog through and get some speed, mm. it's actually kind of a little satisfying in that way. Mm. That's true. And this day was really warm as well. Mm -hmm. So we were getting sweaty. a bit sweaty. And <laughs> <laughs> sweaty, sweaty and muddy. Mu and muddy, yeah. For yeah. sure. I'm sure the guy picking you up would have appreciated that as well. Yeah, there was a reason I sat further to the back in that little mini bus. Mm. He didn't he, he was a professional, consummate professional and did not <laughs> mention <laughs> the odor. Yep. <laughs> That's why we're paying the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys are kind of wading through a whole lot of marshy and boggy areas. And then you kind of then swing back to go to Trapper's Hut. Um, and kind of link up your your loop section mm. before you finish. Yep, and then it's all downhill. I think we stopped and had some lunch. Yeah, we had because oh. we we arrived early because we we knew we needed to be there for a certain time, and we knew that the, the the descent to the car park would take a certain amount of time. So we stopped, had lunch at Trappers. There's a little creek that runs by there. Again, makes sense that there was a water source nearby because people would have been. You know, staying up there for months at a time, and yeah, it was it was a good spot to just relax and chill out, get refill our water, and um, wait for our our vehicle to take us out. So a lovely three day hike that you guys enjoyed after a, a long Queensland stint, or at least Donovan's long Queensland stint. Mm. Yeah, it was nice, intense, kind of three days. Mm. Kind of, sh I quite like it as a length of a hike. 
like an overnight hike. That's mm. kind of ideal Even though for you me. don't sleep. <laughs> no, even though I don't sleep, but I think three days is a good amount. You're kind of out there enough to really get out and disconnect, but soon enough to have a shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think you liked that when we did um, when we did bailing up to Pemberton, we stopped at... Donnelly River Village in between, and you liked having And that. I like the cape to cape that we were able every second night to have a shower. It's yeah. something for me. I just like being able to clean off the sweat and the the dirt and have a nice sleep in a clean mm. Mm. So you would not have enjoyed hiking with Don in the early 2000s when everything had to be camping and doing it tough and... No. Yeah, I've suddenly mellowed out. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. I'm the reason he's mellowed. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I've had to toughen up. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of Tassie hike, I know you kind of will compare it to the the Overland. Mm. Where would you rate this in terms of a, a user experience? I think this is probably the... If you're doing talking about Alpine Tassie, this is probably the best second hike to do. I think the Overland's still the best because it's so user-friendly. And there's something epic about the fact that it's Cradle Mountain to Lake St. Clair. I think the scenery on this is just as good would you agree, Alyssa? Yeah, definitely. It's um, in some ways, it's probably easier than the Overland. the The terrain is certainly, except for the beginning and the end, is probably easier. B- but the scenery is just as good. And the only thing that really is, you know, a bit of a markdown is that the facilities aren't as good. But really, if you're tenting it, it's you know, what's the difference? And really? if you're only staying two nights. Yeah. It's only two nights of the facilities. It's not seven days or eight days or however long on the overland. Mm. Mm. And as a free hike experience, basically, it's pretty much like yeah. you would get on the Billman, except you have to tent it instead of staying in a shelter. Yeah, and the you know the, there's definitely the the water and the toilet facilities that you would expect on a quality hike. The you know the scenery is great, and it's great in autumn when you get the snow and the autumn leaves so it's really a fantastic hike and i think it's a good option for people who if they tried to book the overland weren't able to get it this is a free one it's not as busy so it does feel a lot more like a wilderness you get that same sense when you stand on the mountains that you don't see any roads anywhere that you get on the overland which is really nice so very similar experience fantastic scenery you know good facilities even if it's not at the same standard as the Overland. It's something that I think a lot of people should do. I think it's it should... If the Overland wasn't as famous as it is, I think there would be a lot more people talking about it. Mm. Um, the fact that there's not as many people. You just have nice. to consider how you're getting in, I think is the main thing to plan for. Yeah. Because mm. that's... You know, it's not as user-friendly in that sense. Yeah. But... In, if you're going to go and do more alpine exploration in Tassie, I think there was someone else who is a Tasmanian who had, you know, I think someone asked this on a Facebook group and she said, yeah, do the overland first, then look at something like Wolves of Jerusalem. And then from there you can look at other things. So I think if you're going to go and you're going to tackle West Arthur's as your first hike yeah. there, it's insanity. <laughs> yeah, Alyssa is shaking her head. <laughs> That will be a... That's a, a you guys can Mark go trip. do that. Yeah. <laughs> I will sit in a, a beautiful yeah, a, a, cabin. A chalet bunny. <laughs> yeah, I will be the chalet bunny. Yeah. I'll have the fondue ready. Mm. Mm. So what are you guys' lasting impressions from the walls of Jerusalem? I'll go you first, Alyssa. Let's like sum it up in a sentence or two. Whoa. I don't know. Winter Wonderland. It was, I think for me, the... I mean, obviously, the beauty of the alpine landscape, the the ice and the snow, for me, was a huge novelty. The fact that I didn't have to walk up, up, up the whole time, amazing. Plateaus, thumbs up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all the wildlife. There were wallabies and possums and quolls and, yeah, it's quite, I don't know, it's magical. Mm. Donovan? Fantastic wilderness experience. I think it, it that rivals the Overland Track in terms of sheer alpine beauty. And if you love pencil pines as much as I do, then you will love this hike because there's just so much of it. 
that and and mountains of dolerite so i think if you if you love the overland track this is the great sort of second act you can see the overland from it as well so that's it just brings back memories and you're in a similar thing so it's a good way of not repeating the overland and getting a similar experience excellent all right and on that note we'll finish up thank you very much for listening and we'll see you in two weeks and if you have any questions email us at realtrailtalk oh, at gmail.com we... and if you've enjoyed this pod and any of our other pods please give us a rating on itunes it helps us to you know know that we're doing the right thing and that people are enjoying enjoying the show so thank you everyone